Manchester United. Now, to something very different, I'm delighted to say Paul Gavin is here with us this morning. Good morning to you, Paul. How are you doing? Good morning, guys. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about was the uh, new Kerry jersey. It's our first chance to, to talk to you properly about it. Um, there was a massive response, really, to the launch of the, the new jersey, and obviously it was something that had been in the pipeline for quite a while. What's the story behind it? Uh, yeah, no, I, do, I got, was contacted in a number of them, it was last year, no, last summer actually by the new chairman, Tim Murphy, to, to see if I could put my hand to maybe redesigning re it alongside O'Neill, so I did. Worked closely with O'Neill's on it, and um, yeah, like I think there's just a bit of identity in it, maybe from, from the, the 80s and that, we, we had a, I had a look back at some of the older Kerry jerseys and just kind of returned it maybe to what it was like. I think that 85 jersey is an iconic Kerry jersey. Yeah. So we deepened the colours and just, you know, the white trims and the white cuffs, white collars and cuffs, I think, are important for Kerry jerseys. Yeah. And uh, deep, deepened the colours a little bit. So, um, yeah, it turned out nicely. The players really liked it and the manager, Eamon, liked it and every, everyone was pleased. Kerry Group, a lot of stakeholders with these jerseys, you know what I mean? You, you, have, you have Kerry Group and you have, you have the county board, you have, you have the GA and you have O'Neill. So, you know what I mean? You have, you have a lot of parties to consider. And, but like once the players and the f people supporters like and the players like wearing it, I think it's it's important. And the commercial side is important too. You know, you've got to try and drive a bit of Kerry. Co co need to become a little bit more self-sufficient. I think if they can, yeah. you know. The uh, GA reporters, I can tell you, were very happy with it as well because it just makes the number on the back so yeah, much more yeah, yeah. well, actually that, make out the player. That was part of the brief, actually. Tim really, Tim, yeah. Tim Murphy was here. Was getting it in the ear a little bit from the old. Uh, the old faithful at home, you know, which and it's, I can understand the issue is just that, you know, the number wasn't that visible, but I think the colours, the deeper base and the colour, and uh, elevating the number onto the green more than yeah. more, more the white on the on the green base gives you that that definition. Where did that come from? Like, so, uh, do you, are there other jerseys out there that do that, or are you just thinking? Well, well, Kerry have done that on and off over the years. Right. If you look at the old jerseys. The number's a bit higher there on the back across the shoulders. And just randomly, did you, do you know who was doing that or who was behind that kind of stuff in the past? But like, was that? No, I don't. Very interesting to me, though. You know what I mean? I, I, I but I, I, I did ask. I, I'm not sure who made the '85 jersey. I had a. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll do a quick Google here. Yeah. I'm not sure if it was O'Neill's, and I. You'd suspect it was because they got Adidas obviously in the mid '90s. Yeah, it was a bit of movement, but I mean, no, I'm, I think we did a great job. O'Neill's did a great job, and uh, you know, just there's a bit of storytelling in it, and. Um, is a it bit, possible bit there's no identity. logo on the 85 jersey? Oh, there isn't, the you see, no. GA see and a the bit of guaranteed Irish in the older ones, you yeah. know, and that's about all you'll see. But we're in the kind of a more commercial era now, of course. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, pressure in a project like that, or is it just pure joy? Uh, no, I, 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 you know, once you're clear, I had a clear vision enough in my head of what it should be, so once you can, once you can move towards that, it's fine. But, like, obviously you're, you're dealing with something that has a lot of... Uh, history and a lot of people are very interested in it and have a feel a sense of ownership to it. So yeah, you got to make sure you get it right. You know. Yeah, definitely a huge response to that and a huge response due to the um, mm. the this isn't the away jersey, right? That that would be wrong. Well, to call it the away jersey. I, I, I think it probably would because it's just a commemorative one. I had a conversation with again the stakeholders involved in the in the, the we'll say the ownership of the jersey about maybe commemorating 130 years of Kerry GA in in in. The, I wanted to drive that gold colour a little bit further and I think, I personally, I really like that metallic gold. There's a whole colour psychology at play behind that colour. I mean, the blue is a little bit austere and, uh, yeah, I just thought, I suggested changing it maybe for the year that was in it. It certainly isn't a replacement. I wouldn't have the power nor the desire to go replacing a, uh, the Kerry Blue jersey by any means, which I kind of bothered me a little bit in the, in the aftermath. It's, it was a bit of stuff and people were thinking maybe that I had come along and changed the colours. We changed the colours this year for the 130 years. It won't be my decision. It isn't my decision. I don't have the power to change or, but you know, I suggested it and we, we everyone just, everyone felt it was a good idea to, 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 to maybe try something new this year and the players really liked it again. The players and management really liked it. What's the, what is the psychology behind the gold? Well, there's a yes, you know, it's 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 a it's a color that invokes these feelings of of success and 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 um, um, victory, and you know, there's a little bit of that aspect to it that yeah. I I think can be important. You know what I mean? When you're what you're wearing, you know, you can transfer you can transfer power through what you wear and transfer through, through color, particularly in that. So, I think you know, I study these things through my work with with Duns and that. So, I'm big into color stories. 
And another little thing that bugged me was like people jersey, 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 like as if players go out on the field wearing just jerseys. You know yeah. what I mean? Like they go out naked from the waist down. You know, like so it's a uniform. You know what I mean? It never, it's never designed or created in isolation. You have to like, bat, like that's why the Kerry socks have a white have a white foot on them again, just to balance the white sole with the shorts and the jersey with the with the top of the socks. You know yeah. what I mean? So the I really like the balance of that black and gold jersey, but to me it's always a uniform. There's no white sole on the black sock for the black and gold uniform because that, that white sole would mess up the whole kit. Yeah. It had to be black and then that gold just to be impactful on top. But so, like, you know what I mean? For me, it's a deeper process than just saying, oh, that jersey is not nice or that jersey is nice. It's a uniform that carries a lot more meaning and identity and, and hopefully power and impact when you take the field. Mm. You know I mean, that's the, the whole point of it is you look you look like a team and you look impactful and like you know I, I, I like the blue kit I think the blue kit should make will, I think it will make a return but it won't, it won't be my decision whether it does or not yeah. but I think I think next year it, I would hope that it does but you know what I mean well, it's a chance now to have a third kit like and that's not well harm. listen this is it Jar, you know what I mean the commercials and I, I don't like using the word but you know, I think Kerry can become a bit more, maybe... I have good friends around the world that have been raising money. My friend Jerry Rochford in London and guys in the States raising big money for Kerry football. And I think we need to start to maybe become a bit more self-sufficient down in Kerry as well to start a bit, raise a bit more of our own. So, just to be clear, 130 years ago, Kerry wore gold and well, gold No, only. they weren't gold, no, but the, but the, 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 the GAA was founded in Kerry in 1888. Okay. Sa- same as Celtic, actually. 1888, Celtic, right. Celtic Football Club, yeah. yeah. Oh, Kerry uh, G.A. was on it. Kerry G.A. was on it. So yeah. don't forget the hurlers are in it as well, like, you know what yeah. I mean? The hurlers and the handball people. So Kerry G.A. was founded in 1888. Right. And uh, so this, this, this says 130 on the back. There's, there's a bit of embossing on the back of the jersey that says 130 in the, the Kerry crest. So, like, you know, I think it works. And I, I, think, I think most people like it. And I think it'll drive some, some sales, maybe extra revenues to the county board, which is the most important thing. Not the most important thing, but an important thing. Yeah, um, two things. One, I was curious, there's three stripes. Uh, Adidas obviously have the three stripes, but O'Neill seem to have three stripes in Ireland. O'Neill's do, yeah. yeah. It looks great. Right. Great, great bit of business back in the day. <laughs> they, 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 copped, they copped that, I think. Um, I, think Ad, I think Adidas didn't cover Ireland in their, in their, in their uh, registration. And, and no one else have license to use that tree stripe, which is fantastic, and it looks brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It looks so brilliant. the next step is obviously the track suits, the classic Adidas track suits with the tree stripes made by O'Neill's. Surely that's Single the color. obvious business model right here, no? Yeah, talk to me. <laughs> it's, good, it's a good show. Um, just one very quick one before we move on. Just on the the full kit. Um, does Kieran Donnelly not wear different socks to everybody else? Or am I just making that up? Does he just... For Kerry? Yeah, for Kerry. Does he like wear a solid allowed. green and everybody else wears stripy socks? Am I just making that up? No, he wouldn't be allowed. No, he wears... But he wears them pulled up. Maybe that's why it looks different. Maybe it does. Maybe I'm being paranoid. Because as soon as you mentioned that everybody's uniform, the first thing I thought <laughs> yeah. was that Donahue wears different no, socks. Everyone, everyone thinks of the jersey. I, and I think a lot about the socks, actually. And how the socks should be. What are the socks with the, the gold jersey? What colour are they? They're all black. black. With a gold trim, with a gold hoop. Okay, right. Hoop. So to intimidate, I did a thing recently where Bernard Brogan was talking about how they would all go out the week of a, a match and get their championship haircuts, look good, play good was the uh, motif behind it. Um, as far as I know, Pawdy would have been the first one with a championship haircut back in the day. Pawdy he was, was the, one the who first invented man it. to do a lot of things. Pawdy was ahead of his time in many ways. I cut my own hair there for years and I, didn't, I never liked to get a haircut around the time of a game. But um, yeah, that's a thing. Young fellas now and championship haircuts. I, yeah. Beyond all that stuff, no. <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, design and sport generally. Um, I'm going to talk about Kylian Mbappe in a moment, but I remember when we had Andy Mitten on and he was talking about the decision that was made by Manchester United to invest a world record fee in Paul Pogba. And one of the things that the club did, obviously from a football perspective, the decision is yes, we would like him, but the club had to justify spending a, a world record transfer fee. And they looked at his social media following and they decided as an individual he can help us push our brand to people that we're not already reaching. So it's clearly a concern for footballers at that level and for uh, sportswear companies and for brands generally to try and engage with sport through individuals if you can't if you can't take the full sponsorship of a club obviously there was a nice crossover for Manchester United and um, Pogba but there are other ways and means to do it by rowing in behind individuals now, I think it depends on the club in some ways like I think at United it's a it's it's a bit too much of a consideration. I think, I think it is certainly a consideration when United come to sign the players at the moment. United have become very, <coughs> very commercial to my mind, but yeah, I think Pop, Adidas, United, Pogba was a perfect 
for United in terms of you know claiming back some of that 90 million and getting content you know what I mean like United are like you know remind me of a social media agency at the moment yeah it's as much about content and and the players social media platforms as it seems to be about actually the the real true identity like, there's a bit of romance missing from United at the moment for me I you know they're they're hard to love at the moment so I think that 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 model that business model from the top down has lost its way a bit I think and Adidas seem to have a big handle on the club at the moment, you know, in terms of getting players to churn out content and create a bit of value. I think I think Edward were commercial leverages the club on the back of on the back of social media feeds and mentions and impressions and followers. I think that's part of the business model to go and leverage with the Asian these Asian sponsors the, the that you have. Tractor makers and whatever. You know, I, I, you know, I'd leave you a bit cold. Of course, it's an it's it's a part of the part of the conversation for any professional club. It's even a part of the conversation for amateur associations now. You know. Amateur being the amateur in inverted commas, but yeah, um, yeah, Pogba would be a kind of a marketing tool in many ways for United. I think he he needs a little bit of handling and a little bit of direction on the field probably at this point now. Is it possible to create a brand today that can be based on a storied history like Manchester United or Liverpool, or does it have to be an investment in a cool individual like Paul Pogba? Well, I'd say the I'd say the former for sure because in my daily work I think about storytelling and identity and meaning all the time, and and I I think that's where the real value lies if you can find, um, do your reading and do your research and start to mine the the traditions of a club like United, I mine culture, I read a lot and I research a lot and I find things that interest me to put into collections uh, over at Duns, but. Uh, Listen, the other way is probably easier. You know what I mean? A guy with a fifty million followers on 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 uh, yeah on, t- on Instagram, get him into some Adidas gear and put him out and make a video. It's a transaction. It's a bit transactional, you know. Yeah. Like the Sanchez thing is very hard on Sanchez, who I think is a superb player. But to sign Sanchez and put him playing the piano and spend a day recording content with him, surely I'm not sure that's right. But like that's that's the way the world and United are a very wealthy club, probably on the back of it. So you you, you can't have it everywhere. I just wish it was a little less little less of the commercial stuff. Mbappe seems to be a different example. You've, you've got him um, here. Uh, talk to us about Yeah, I thought that was very interesting yesterday. This is Kylian Mbappe unboxing the, this, this Nike Mercurial designed by Off-White, which is a really, a, a really cult brand in the US by a guy called Virgil Abloh, who's, a, who's an architect by trade. Started making tour merchandise for Kanye West. Set up Off-White has just been recently named Men's Artistic Director at Louis, Vuitt- Louis Vuitton. I always have trouble pronouncing that one. But, but Louis Vuitton are based in Paris. It looks like Virgil Abloh is going to move from the States to Paris to take over the men's wear. It's, it's in, the luxury, in the luxury market and followers of Louis Vuitton have had a bit of a problem with this because he's a very outside-the-box appointment to the position. But I just thought it was very interesting to see Off-White care of Nike so Abloh's company, Off-White, have been collaborating with Nike for the last two years, redesigning the Air Maxes and Jordans and all those iconic Nike pieces of footwear. He's gone into the archive, put this Off-White slant on it, and they've been selling box loads of, of Nike footwear. Again, they've got a really good re- return off this collaboration with him. So he's now gone into football boots with them. And I think that he sees probably when he's moving to Paris with Louis Vuitton, there'll be a lot of pressure on him to take some market share back off Gucci in that luxury market sector. Gucci have kind of taken over, passed out Louis Vuitton in, in terms of market share. So, so they see Virgil Abloh being a big appointment. It's like managers. It's a bit, it's a, Gucci, Gucci and Louis Vuitton are like City and United. And they're appointing people to try and, you know, win the, win the Premier League. And yet it's interesting that, like, um, so... Off White is a, a small brand. Off White's like a small cult. Well, it's it's getting bigger and bigger. It's a real cult brand. Street, sports street brand. Streetwear. It's not really sportswear as such. It's streetwear. Okay. Uh, real cult brand. They have started to collaborate a lot. So they started to work with Nike. He's now on the back of his collaborative work with different brands. Has been appointed at Louis Vuitton. So I think he sees PSG and Neymar, Mbappe, Dani Alves. Being being a big part of his probably uh, there you are they, you know Neymar is a Louis Vuitton man anyway yeah when Kim Jones was there Neymar would have went to a lot of his shows but I think you'll see a lot of Neymar Virgil Abloh Mbappe Alves at Louis Vuitton shows going on, going forward because I think PSG will be part of the Louis Vuitton marketing drive probably going forward.
it's a nice little collaboration for them. You've got these world class, absolutely. With, again, with huge followings, and yeah. you know, look good in the clothes. And so it's not a coincidence they're also doing the same thing that Adidas have done with Pogba. It's like, oh, Mbappe, you've got, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and they're trying to really match what they're trying to really do there is is try and match what Kanye West has done with Adidas, and the easy this easy stuff that Kanye West has been doing with Adidas has been phenomenally successful for Adidas. They've actually overtaken Nike in the in the footwear market in the States, which was a huge thing for them. Yeah. So Was that the first time you ever saw people <coughs> queuing up outside shops overnight for a pair of shoes? Because it happened in this uh, country and I'd never seen it well, in Ireland it, before. It happened here last week. There's a man called Sean, what's his name? Oh, his surname has, has escaped me now, but there was a footwear drop here last week on Angel Street. It happened in, I think it happened in, there was someone Brown Thomas as well, but I drove up Angel Street, coming out of Duns, I saw at least 100 kids outside a store uh, called Nowhere on Angel Street waiting to get their hands on this 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 new footwear drop. Uh, Nike did this thing called 12 Creatives where they have invited 12 creative people from around the world to take a Nike piece of footwear and put their mark on it. So oh, take our old stock, yeah, take reanimate old, it for us. Yeah, redesign, reimagine. So this man made a card, right? You know the, the old card? You ever wear cards? I did back, about, back when I was like 14. Well, a guy <laughs> called Sean, his, his surname's escaping me, Sean something, but he actually made a card, dry Air Max. Right. Great shoe, really cool shoe. and. He won actually, they did, they're in a competition and he won it and the shoe has just gone mad so everyone's banging the doors down. But, but these sneakerheads like her, it's a big, big culture at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting, the PSG example, because A, they're quite a young club and there's kind of a fan base that can be moulded there. But also, you wouldn't associate Louis Vuitton with the, the traditional class of people that watch football. Obviously, that may be different in Paris. No, you wouldn't. And the traditional Louis Vuitton customer won't like probably the appointment of Virgil Abloh. And they mightn't like... They mightn't like the Mbappe and the Neymar Association because there's obviously it's a very exclusive brand. But I mean, what Nike and Adidas have done and what sports would have done to the luxury market recently has made it, made it much more inclusive. Mm. So luxury brands are having to really rethink their strategy now because everyone wants to wear sportswear. Everyone wants to wear a piece of off-white by Nike. Everyone wants to wear Yeezy. And the luxury, the luxury brands are, lose, are actually losing money and they're now having to read re-strategize, introduce a lower price point, collaborate with, with sportswear brands to try and get access to these kids who, who want to wear, or not even these kids, adults who want to wear this stuff. It's funny that they're kind of trying to get the, harness the power of the startups and the smaller companies. When you're a massive corporation, it's, uh, it takes a bit of humility and a bit of vision to go, actually, you know what, I can take somebody who has their own creative ideas and yeah. give them some freedom yeah. and not worry that it's going to tarnish yeah. everything else. There's a fantastic example of it down in Tralee. There's a young startup down in Tralee, a 3D printing company who are, who are now working with Puma on some apparel with Puma, have been working with IKEA and it's basically their idea, their, this startup, their idea is so good that all these big, big, powerful brands with a lot of money want want what they're doing, you know? That's pretty sweet. Yeah, you've, you, and you're also a young kid at, uh, in Puma, you have a young kid from Cork in Puma in a position similar to Virgil Abloh, young dyslexic boy, 20, mid-twenties, designing footwear and gloves and working with a lot of the top Puma footballers, De Br not De Bruyne, Touré and Aguero and Buffon and these guys. Nice. Uh, just a nice Irish, more probably accessible accessible angle, young guy, young guy called Conor O'Brien. So, but these sportswear brands are disrupting the, the, the menswear market and the luxury market particularly quite a lot in the last eight, 12 to 18 months. Sean Wooderspoon, does that sound right? That's the man, yeah. that's the man, that's the man. The, so he's the Nike Corduroy dude. Uh, a text in, ask Paul Galvin his all-time favourite kit. I mean, is there, I presume... Well, we were discussing the, UC, the UCC kit. Yeah, earlier. yeah, all fair. Oh, great kit. We wore it back in '99. Had a good bit of success in it too. Brilliant. It's brilliant not kit. as cool now as it could be. It's almost as if it's uh, ripe for somebody to change it up and have a look. <laughs> oh, talk to the, I'll talk to the boys in O'Neill to see what we can do. Maybe. I'm trying to uh, see if there's a 1999. But it, like my memory of it is, um, occasionally there'd be stickers and matches on Sports Stadium back in the day. I'm aging myself here now, and you'd be like, "What? Thank God, skull and crossbones. That's ridiculous." Yeah, class, yeah, great kit. And a couple of very, like you have the, you have the home on, and actually we, we, wore the, we wore a white one with a, blue, with a black hoop or a red hoop back in 99 a lot. We never wore the black and red in 99. We wore white and, I don't know, was it white and red or white and black? I can't remember now, but it was a great jersey, great kit, but a great kit. Yeah. I was keen to make that point, you know what I mean? The shorts and the socks count. We think you could we have, have a great jersey up. if the shorts and socks are wrong, nothing works. Yeah. 
like it's the black and red color scheme. Is that something you prefer that to idea. whatever the, the white face uh, one? Oh, there you go. There you go. There's a red hoop. Yeah. Oh, so you still have the black as a present. The Duns people, the Duns, my bo the buyers and the design team over in Duns kill me for red, red, particularly red. Why? But, but red, white, and black. I, I, I just love red. But uh, you, they say I, you I use love it too that much. Yeah, I try to get it into collections a lot. Like Tiger Woods um, on Sunday. Exactly like Tiger one, but again, it's color psychology, you know. Yeah, well, that's what it, like everybody sees Tiger and yeah. oh, shit, he's in the red. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, that was a great jersey, that UCC one. That one, I mean, I looked at. I actually last night was posting to my Instagram a uh, brilliant picture. I should have shown it to you. It was uh, England, England '85. It was just a picture of two punks in the England kit and the Scotland kit from the mid '80s. Right. Yeah. And one had a big bloody what's your man out of the Cure? He looked like the guy out of the Cure. Oh, Robert Smith looked like the guy in the English kit and the Scottish kit. Do you remember the Scottish boys used to have a hoop on their jersey yeah. or on their shorts? They used to wear a white shorts with navy hoop around it. And like, geez, they were two two brilliant jerseys. Now from a design point of view, I must say. But again, they were simple and plain, and they were just a plain base with white trims. And I think that's a that makes for a classic. That's anyway. it there, yeah. Oh, there you are, look. Oh, it is actually Robert Smith, right? Is it actually Robert Smith? Yeah, I think so. All right, I wasn't sure, but he's got the hair going on. I sent my brother that picture and he said to me, is that Deli Alley in the Scotland jersey? <laughs> and I had a closer look and I said, geez, it does look a bit like Deli Alley, doesn't it? Um, but the hoop and the shorts is... Uh, I mean, they're two brilliant jerseys and the hoop and the, shor the, hoop and the shorts is remarkable. Are we just of an age now where stuff that happened in the 80s is, is actually cool? Like, do we reach a point where the garishness of the 90s is it's kind in, of... In my, in, my work, in my work, in terms of menswear and design, 80s, 80s... The 80s influence is big, is big at the moment. So, so shoulder pads going um, back. <laughs> kind of like, you know what's, what Giant we're seeing ties. quite a bit of now is kind of big, a bigger silhouette, a baggier silhouette, but a track, bigger track suits. Yeah. Kind of lo looser, oversized sportswear. Yeah. And that's really an 80s influence. That's what, me. What's your least favourite kit? Oh, I always think it's hard to make the Carlo boys look... look do you know what I mean? Just, just the colours again, like, and I study colours a lot, like, and it just, you know what I mean? Hypothetically, you'd be looking in your head, like, having done the carry one, you'd be, fellas would say to you, oh, do you know, are you going to do any more? But, like, do you know what I mean? I won't, uh, I'd like to keep doing the carry stuff, but, yeah. like, you'd look at hypothetically in other counties and you'd say a Cork, iconic, you could, you could really do an awful lot with the Cork one. Yeah. Uh, the Down one, um, but, like, then you look at the Carlo one and you say, geez, that would be hard. Yeah. I think even, I think even the Kilkenny one, would probably be hard to. Yeah, what do you make of that new departure from? I I I like it actually, but I just think as a base, it's going it's going to be hard to make sure. make that. Um, the seventies they had like a square, the the kind of mm. the, the stripe stopped, and there was some of them. Turning it was on the back, and I thought that there was something there's something cool about Eddie Kerr, those pictures. Yeah, yeah, but you know what you notice about those? I think they may have had a white trim and white color white collar on white cuff. And I think they had a white patch with the black number on the back of it. Maybe so, yeah, yeah. If I was to do it with Kilkenny, like you'd probably, but you know, you'd have, obviously this would be only an idea, but I'd look possibly for the white white trims and that, and, but you know, it would, wouldn't be my decision. Yeah. yeah, getting that past Brian Cody could be an issue. Uh, exactly, no, I'd be going to Ned Quinn. <laughs> I'd be going to Ned Quinn on that one. <laughs> Straight over his head. Yeah. Just uh, on another point, uh, and maybe a last point on kind of uh, brands, and just because Anthony Joshua's fighting this weekend, I remember last year during the Klitschko fight, I was like, Anthony Joshua has peaked, Eddie Hearn has peaked, or they're near their peak. But the other thing that I put alongside Hearn and Anthony Joshua as really reaching the promised land was Under Armour. And like you look at their endorsement of Jordan Spieth and you think about whatever 10, 15 years ago, well not even 15 years ago, 10 years ago in this country, it was like, oh, they're the things you wear under your jersey. Whereas using those endorsements, they become, on, not on a level power with Nike and Adidas, but in that realm. Yeah, yeah. Like not only did, it, did Steph Curry, uh, you know, light up the not NBA, it, the best, you know, one of the best players in the NBA, he literally single-handedly dragged Under Armour We'll say into the conversation with Nike and Adidas through through his footwear, through his footwear primarily. He had a Curry one, Curry two, Curry three, the Curry four. I think it was a Curry four. I think he got wrong that tanked. That cost Under Armour quite a lot of money. But Curry one, two, and three made him lots of money. And it's amazing what this in America, these sportswear brands, the Nikes, the Adidas's, and the Under Armours are working directly with these individual players. They're giving them designers. They're giving them individual designers. Le LeBron has got a huge business. Yeah. Russell Westbrook is a huge business, James Harden is a huge business, and Steph Curry is a, is a massive part of the Under Ar Armour operation. What's, uh, just while you brought up basketball there, what's your view on the big baller brand? Yeah, the dad's a bit off-putting, you know. The dad's a bit off-putting, but the, the boy seems to be able for it. What's his name? La, La, Lonzo. Lonzo. Lonzo Ball. He seems to be able for it. 
he's at the Lakers now, I think. He is, yeah. And, you know, he came along basically, the father played real hard ball, he was offered deals and they get these deals from the sportswear companies and basically what the father wanted was that the sportswear company would invest into a big baller and that the boys would have their own brand backed by the Adidas or the Nike or whoever it might be. Um, so is that going to become the future maybe of people with big egos, big talents uh, as rookies? Listen, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a case of having a businessman who can find the route to mark, we'll say, find manufacturing capability to create a proper shoe that's usable in the league, get a license to use it. Uh, like the, the, this, There's a whole supply chain and manufacturing angle that's really, really the, the crux of the business that's yeah. very difficult. Yeah. That the Nikes have the muscle, and the, mm. in my case it's the Duns have the muscle. Adidas have the muscle. That's the real crux of the business. I, I couldn't do what I do on my own, really. It would be it would be difficult starting out unless you had a lot of... You got crazy. Ah, it's really tough. It's really tough. So, I mean, good luck to him if that's what Lonzo Ball's dad wants to do. I was talking to Tommy Bow about this recently and he said he's been in every shop in Ireland that stocks their stuff. And, like, that's hard work. You know, that's like going face-to-face to meet small-town uh, shop owners where they might be the only menswear outlet and he'll walk in and go... Your clothes, they're too small. Your shoes, I need more, much smaller sizes. You go to the next town, it's like, I need bigger sizes. And he's like, I, <laughs> you know, I, I can't, can't please everybody all the loads time. Loads of moving parts, loads of moving parts. I'm going from here over to the Swan Centre in Rat Mines now to meet the people that work in my brand over there and I'm doing some fitness fitness accessories at the moment, the old foam rollers and the speed bands and the old uh, a balance cushion, actually, which is something I think GA players should be part of their daily, their daily practice, balance work and proprioceptive work. But... Yeah, lo- loads of moving parts in the business. There's always bloody challenges and, and stuff con- to conversations to be had, yeah. yeah. Uh, just a reminder, OTB AM is brought to you this morning with AIR, the home of AIR Sport. Get amazing live sporting content for free with AIR Broadband. Two quick comments to wrap up. Stuart Adamson from Big Country was the guy wearing the Scotland jersey in that one. Thanks to Brian Duggan for pointing that, that, that one out. And uh, Willie Walsh wants to know, can you ask Paul, do you need to consider the sponsor's logo when designing a jersey, as it often ruins it? He says, yes, we yes. love all our sponsors on this show. You do, you do. And we had, obviously, they were they were in the conversation. It was very collaborative between me and O'Neill's. I was given a brief, basically, by the county board. I had my vision for it. I put that forward to O'Neill's. O'Neill said, well, we can do this, we can do that, we can do the other. Ultimately, you know... It's a collaboration between me and Jenny over and Jenny Jenny Brown over and O'Neill's in terms of the final. But I had a couple of things: white trims, white white collar, white cuff, a certain combina- color combination for the base. The sponsors then have to be looked after. Yeah, they are. I think it works though. It's like because it's Kerry, because it's like that's well, the name on the shirt. It's exactly who we are. It's kind of a you know there are some other counties that don't have. Um, it's not a logo. It's just a square with the thing in it and that just destroys it. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, it's, a, it's a thing that gets lost. Or like It's a consideration that gets lost when you talk about managers in the GA today and players in the GA today and the, the, we'll say the expectation upon them. Not the ask, but the expectation upon them in terms of the media that they do, you know? Like they're walking advertising. They're walking advertisements in many ways, like, you know? And That's and where the tension comes from. Like a lot of the tension comes from everybody's making out from this. Except us. Yeah, yeah, it's a funny one, it's a funny one to, ba- to get the balance right in, you know, but um, I suppose, you know, yeah, the jersey, there's, 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 there's plenty of stakeholders when it comes to these jerseys, you know what I mean? And you just, they are all in it for the right reasons. Yeah. And they, you know, nobody wants to, nobody wants to own it, but, you know, everyone wants to be part of the story of, of a particular county and, and it's, it's fantastic in many ways, you know what I mean? It's just, Local businesses get, and it's a great, you know, I think these sponsors, you could, you'd, I'd like to hear more from them at times and their story and their backstory and, you know what I mean, how they started up. I think just this, this, this start-up culture and this business culture, I think, has blown up in Ireland in the last, well, two years or so. Yeah. You see all these newspaper supplements now and it's, the business parts are getting bigger and bigger and actually the sports content within the business supplements is getting bigger and bigger, so it's a very interesting time at the moment for... Yeah. For sure. Uh, one last point, you're back playing club football in Kerry, is that right? Well, I'm backing, I'm back. My registration is back in Kerry with my club in Fenwick. And, uh, will you get a game? Will I get a game is the question now. You know, so look, I mean, I'll probably, this will be, I think this will be my last year now playing football. Whatever, how much I play, I don't know. But I just wanted, to, uh, that was always my intention, was that whatever couple of games I play now will be my last few games and they'll, yeah. be, they'll be with Fenwick. So that's all that is. And... Uh, just important for me personally and uh, 
you know. Are you still the same footballer you always were? Is that like your is your game the same, or have you become? Uh, in hurling, you can kind of move out to midfield and just catch ball and, and play around. Mm. But football's not quite the same, is it? The game is different. The game is different. Like I don't see too many players of my type really in the game anymore. I don't see players in that area. Do you know, do you know what I mean? I don't see players occupying those half forward areas. Yeah. I just don't see them in the positions. Do you know what I mean? I think positional play. There are more defenders now. It, well, they're running. I think everyone runs a lot more now. Anyway, positions are positions are less less important in many ways. Do you know what I mean? Especially up front. Yeah. It's a very very fluid game now at the moment, and like uh, so like. I don't know, Joe, what kind of a footballer I am as a while since I played. <laughs> I got up, but I'll tell you one thing: I'm a different. Fo- I'd, be, I'd be a different footballer in Dublin to the football I'd be, in, I'd be in Kerry anyway. That's for sure. What do you mean by that? Well, it's a different, different game up here. Like, and and I see, you know, I played in Cork, I played in UCC, played in the Cork County Championship for two years, Kerry County Championship, the Dublin County Championship, and I was probably a different footballer in all those championships. You know, different culture. You know, the counties have different cultures and different ways of playing, and you have to right. adapt, you have to adapt to them and. Um, so we'll see. You know, I'll go home. I might do a bit with the boys and give it, give it up, for, give it up for the boys at home for a, for a for a finish. And well, best of luck with it and enjoy it. Thanks. Um, you've opened a whole can of worms there about uh, the different club cultures, which we might get back into at some point in the future. But for now, we're out of time. So my thanks to Paul for joining us in studio today. My thanks as well.